attention, please. Hey everyone, welcome again to Back in the Village, The Prisoner podcast, where we cover all 17 episodes of the British sci-fi classic, The Prisoner. This week we have episode 12, A Change of Mind, and I want to apologize if there's any clicks and clacks in the audio in some sections, because unfortunately, my dog was being a bit unmutual himself while we were recording this, because we had to do it on Skype. I've also put some info about Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, a movie we talk about a little bit in the show, on the website, backinthevillage.com, so definitely check that out. So here you go. Enjoy a change of mind. Good morning, good morning. Welcome back to Back in the Village, the Prisoner Podcast. I am Clay McCormick from EatDeadMeat.com, and with me again is Wes Teasdale from Penske File. How are you doing, Wes? Good, Clay. How are you? Good, well, good. Unfortunately, we're on Skype again this week for, you know, various reasons, but uh, hopefully it doesn't sound too awful. No, no. We'll, we'll, we'll work on the post-production after this is all said and done. <laughs> we got we to gotta equalize and uh, engineer. I can add so many different kinds of vocal effects through GarageBand. Uh, we could do the whole thing as though we just sucked in a balloon full of helium if you want. We should just do it all in auto-tune. <laughs> the, uh, the prisoner is very good. I have problems with this episode. <laughs> anyway, speaking of this episode, today we are covering episode... I've lost count. I think it's number 12. I think it's 12. I agree. Uh, it's called A Change of Mind. It was written by Roger Parks. And directed by one Joseph Surf, which is a pseudonym for Patrick McGowan. He's back. He is back. Uh, what are your uh, thoughts at the front of this one? Um, I think I have a decent amount to say about this. Sorry if my my voice just broke there for a second. Um, the, <laughs> I think I have a little. I I think we're getting to the point in the series where I have uh, some conclusions I could make and. Um, I feel like this episode falls into a a sort of a point where you can see what the show it can and can't do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this one is pretty representative. I like this one, though. Um, yeah. I really yeah. like the first half. I don't know if the second half is as good. Yeah, I think uh, that's exactly how I feel about it as well. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, that, that's that, that's pretty much my general take. We'll get. I'll break down my other deeper thoughts, I guess, as we go along. Mm-hmm. Well, let's uh, let's let's recap it a little bit. Uh, basically, this episode, um, they the, the village tries to attack number two from a uh, from a social standpoint, where they uh, they've they've taken away uh, his his previous life. Um, they've taken away uh, his interaction with everybody else in the village, and now they're they're trying to make him basically just a ghost. Uh, who is a complete outcast, and uh, it, at least that's the first half. The second half gets into like a it gets a little gray and seems like it's kind of a bit of a rehash of A, B, and C a little bit. A little um, bit, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but anyway, and sort of free for all. Yes, yeah. There's a little bit of free for all in there as well. Yeah, but uh, basically, what happens is. Um, Number six is is uh, uh, as antisocial by nature as everybody realizes by this point. Yes, yep. And uh, in the village, this is very very frowned upon, or at least in this episode, it's very very frowned upon. <laughs> and uh, he is he is declared unmutual and being a uh, a uh, un uh, he's contri- an uncontributing member of society. Yeah, yeah. So he is uh, put through. Basically, uh, behavior modification, which is called uh, shit. I wrote it down. Oh, he's he's put through instant social conversion. Yep. Uh, which is basically a lobotomy. But the twist to this episode is that it's a fake lobotomy. They're trying to trick him into thinking he's been lobotomized because they want to, as always, find out why he resigned. But they don't want to damage him. You're right. Yeah. So they figure, well, if if we can convince him he's been lobotomized and get him under control that way, then he'll have nothing left. No, nothing left to live for, basically. So he'll yeah, nothing left anyone. to live for, and his the the lobotomy uh, takes out the aggression center, 
and yeah. the inhibitions of of your of your mind, so he'll have no reason to to hold the secrets in. Right. Uh, of course, he figures it out very quickly, and the turn at the end is that he actually has the village turn on number two by declaring number two unmutual in a good ending, but a bad execution. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But that's pretty much pretty much the the summary of the episode. Yep. Yep. Keeping it all to yourself, number six. Not at all the action of a public-minded citizen. The committee wouldn't like that. No, the committee certainly wouldn't. <laughs> Uh, the first thing I want to point out is uh, we have the earliest gratuitous, I think, yet, uh, because it's the first scene. Yeah, well, we, we, we fortunately, uh, we get another view of his jungle gym, literally yes, a jungle yes. gym. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, he definitely puts the jungle back into jungle. <laughs> and and was, do you know if this show was produced before or after the, uh, the last one? This is the very next episode produced. So okay. It's episode number nine. Okay, so, so they were really just reusing uh, the set there, which I mean, it's good. It's good, but it, it's definitely this is not the introduction of the jungle gym. Right, okay. right. It's a, you'll you'll notice some of that going through because, like, uh, like last episode, this is a very stock heavy episode, yeah. stock footage heavy episode, and a lot of. Uh, studio stuff as opposed to on location Port Marion stuff, yes. uh, which, yep. which you can you can hilariously see at the end. I, I'm sure you wouldn't have noticed the stuff at the time on, on a television in the 60s, but on a giant TV in HD in 2015, you can notice in the last scene where they're having their big uh, 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 meeting where number two is declared on mutual, the long shots. Yep. Where you can see six and two at like the the, the background of the crowd. Right. Is clearly not either one of those actors. Oh. <laughs> like the number two is about fifty pounds lighter, and his hair is completely different. Yep, yep. Yeah, uh, just put him in a black jacket; it'll fuzz it up in standard yeah, definition. Ex- see what exactly. Goes on. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, it's an an early ass kicking scene that was kind of like the guys. The guys in it, um, one of them is emitting very strange yelps every time he gets punched. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Wilhelm scream. Uh, no, it's not even that. It's more like he gets punched. He's like, <laughs> and the uh, <laughs> the one guy who really sells the when he gets knocked down, he grabs the rope and sort of like falls down, but holds onto the rope. Yeah, uh, which is he like really he really sold his uh, his fall there. I was yeah. getting. Um, I don't know if I'm just noticing something like this, but I, I was getting sort of an erotic overtone to that fight. <laughs> It was it was real. You're just, you're just constantly looking for a reason to declare number six a homosexual. It was real deliverancy. Uh, <laughs> the way that they just sort of come up and are like, "What are you doing out here all by yourself?" It's like, well, you know, it's funny because what I actually got from that and I thought was interesting is it reminded me of a Clockwork Orange a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. Especially after uh, I can't remember the the main guy's name, but after he has his, well, he basically has his own uh, social rehabilitation therapy. Yep. Um, and he meets up with his, his buddies who used to be the, uh, 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 the law breaking ass kickers. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're now cops. Right. Yep. And it reminded me of that a little bit, this idea that they just take the people who, uh, were breaking the law and now have given them the power of the law. So they're still doing horrible things, but they're just doing it behind, behind a uh, badge. Yeah. Behind a badge. Yep. Uh, I don't know if it, I don't know if this sequence is that deep but that at least that's what it uh it, it, it reminded uh, you of it reminded me of yeah did um were they wearing jeans in that first scene <clears throat> those 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 hooligans i <laughs> i don't know uh, they, they were wearing, wranglers wranglers yeah probably. they were i think they were wearing jeans at least in the second scene and it was really odd because i think it's the first appearance of jeans that we've seen <laughs> um just to show them mark, as, mark it down just to show them as street toughs um but yeah they um they have a little bit of a, a rough and tumble fight. A, another sort of a lot of cuts, a lot of cuts in that fight scene, uh, which yeah. is interesting. They spent a lot of time shooting them, and uh, I yeah, just to tie into your the uh, the sets looking weird. Like when he's when number six is has the the wide shot of him hitting the punching bag, mm-hmm. and then they cut to 
the cl- of him looking at the camera as he's hitting the bag. Mm-hmm. It's just a clearly he's in a different area. Oh yes, yeah, it, yeah. 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 <laughs> he's, he's out in like a pasture in the mm-hmm. the fields where they're like the camera's looking head on at him. But the sky in, is a completely different color. Yeah, right? and yeah. he doesn't look like he's deep in the Amazon anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, but it you know uh, that fight scene then leads into uh, them bringing number six into the. Uh, the council chamber for his yeah smash basically. smash cut to the council chamber. He really yeah. I don't know why he goes there. I yeah. I assume it was well. I assume the entire thing is kicked off by you know number two is behind it. So I'm sure that he sent those guys to beat him up. So he would then be uh, uh, remanded to social aversion therapy or whatever. It's yeah, called. I guess it's just him sort of being defined because. The only reason we know about this is because after one of the hooligans get their ass kicked, he's like, "You'll have to answer to the council for this." And then it just shows him walking <laughs> yeah. into the council building. Like, he council? Can- what count? Oh, that council. Yeah, okay. right. I'll, I'll head there after my uh, morning workout, if you don't mind, after my water skiing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then he. But I, it's just. I guess it's just to save time. But he he really just yeah, heads probably. over there. Yeah. But uh, so that basically that brings us into. Uh, the most interesting part of this episode, um, as we both said, uh, the first half of this episode, I think, is much more interesting, much better, and probably one of my, f- I hate to say it's my favorite half episode of Prisoner, but yep. uh, it's its the most um, Orwellian that they've gotten since probably the first episode or maybe this this one other one maybe but this one is very much uh has that dystopic um orwellian type uh science and social social conversion to it that i really liked i really like when they get into this territory yeah and it's the um it's one of the few situations where six actually feels in danger at a certain Mm. like the the power of the mob basically that um isn't always present like the village kind of feels harmless a lot of the time and yes this this is the one time where he actually it felt like he was in it was that scene where he actually gets caught by the mob which is a little bit ahead of this but it, it was pretty um it was well directed it's like exciting mm-hmm. it's sort of you're on the edge of the earth it felt very game of thronesy almost of like <laughs> some, someone just being dragged through the street it is your clear duty, number 93, to prove that you are once again a suitable member of our society. The only way for you now to regain the respect of your fellows is to publicly acknowledge your shortcomings. Go to the rostrum and confess. We will tell you what to say. I, I guess uh, this is a good enough place where um, I can say one of my thoughts that I was thinking. This is the first episode where I felt... Wes, I will tell you what to think and what to say. <laughs> I'm being unmutual of my opinions. Um, <laughs> this is the first one where I felt that the costuming decisions was a disservice to the show. Okay. Are you talking about all the striped polo shirts? Yes, and like all everything the village, everything the villagers wear. Everyone's dressed like a like a pirate? Yeah, or like a pirate on a picnic or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I felt like this was the first, and I, I liked the tone of it. Like, I liked how dark it was. Mm. And I felt like, I guess you could say it's sort of being, like, ironic or something, but it, it doesn't feel, when these people are, like, what are, what are the group of the four women who sort of come into his house and yell at him all the time? Oh, yeah, the uh, the uh, appeal subcommittee. Yeah, it's just, it's hard to take them seriously, or... It's. I think it's just a jarring disconnect between what they're wearing and what they're threatening him with, mm, which mm. which has been okay in previous episodes because it was a little bit lighter and like the villagers are are more sort of like they're either pawns or they're just playing this game. Um, and this one, I, I felt like it was the first time I noticed. It. I was like, I wish they wore a little bit more straight ahead costuming. Um, yeah. Well, I, I wonder if that's not intentional because um, what you're saying is pretty much what the way number six is thinking in that he doesn't take any of this seriously. Right. Um, you know, there's that's even when he comes into the council chamber and he sees, uh, the first guy come out. Well, he sees everybody there, like clearly mentally distraught. And then that first guy comes out and he has that whole thing where, uh, uh, he's told what to say and how to apologize. And yeah. uh, Yeah. Then six goes into the council chamber, which is another reused set. But I mean, I like that set, so I'm I'm fine with that. Yeah, I like the uh, the the where the guy just sort of recites the apology. 
yes, um, yes, is yeah. kind of a it's kind of a nice thing. It t- it probably is one of the things that ties in most with uh, modern society, which I think the show doesn't always do. But th- that one really does. Oh, I especially around like you know how um in the recent news, uh, Renner and oh, yeah. the, for the Avengers they had to apologize because they sort of they called the Black Widow a slut, like the actual yeah, the yeah. fictional character a slut. Yeah. Um, you know, and just sort of like having to apologize for that and just having someone tell you what to say and then apologizing, and then everyone buys into it. Everyone's just like, good. They apologized. <laughs> like, right. This- I think, I, I think that this episode, the first half anyway, is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I think the first half of this episode is very topical as far as, as today goes. Right. Um, it has, uh, uh, it, the whole idea of, uh, s- not so much the social conversion aspect, but the idea that um, there is only one right way to do something, and that's the way that you are told to do it. Yes, I think is is you can apply quite a bit to the uh, the way that a lot of people handle different situations today. Like there's <clears throat> there's a constant fear of offending people and you have to make sure you tick off all the boxes before you say something. Otherwise you're going to have to make an apology because you offended someone that you didn't even know exist. You know, right. Like yep. that, it's that, that sort of hyper, uh, sensitivity. Hyper scru- yeah. Sensitivity and hyper scrutin- scrutin- scrutiny. Is that the right? Scrutiny. Scrutiny. There we go. <laughs> Scru- scrutiny. Uh, scrutiny. That, that's the H and S scrutiny, which they, yeah. uh, they sailed in on. <laughs> Uh, but that that sort of idea that um, you know, uh, I, I, comedians have to deal with a lot these days. Where well, you can't make a joke if it offends anybody. Well, I mean, that's what jokes generally are: <laughs> something that offends somebody. Right. Um, I've never heard so, a funny, non-offensive joke. I don't think <laughs> some clever wordplay. <laughs> Why did the chicken cross the road? Because he was very capable and wanted to achieve something. Oh, and he did. oh my God, that's hilarious. Yes, I know. <laughs> we all know, I'll be we at, all know chickens are too stupid to achieve anything, Clay. After after this podcast, you can find me at the Chuckle Hut off of uh, <laughs> Route Nine, 90, <laughs> Route Nine in in Connecticut. <clears throat> but uh, you know, but that that kind of idea. Uh, there's even there's a great scene that I, I watched a couple times because it, it fascinated me so much. Where uh, number six is on the verge of becoming declared unmutual, so he has to basically go to. Uh, 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 social, um, like that club. The, yeah, yeah, like it, like what it's a. I don't know if, what the exact term would be, but sort of a. It's almost a support group. Yes, it's a, a support group for people who are trying to deal to try to figure out um, uh, how to 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 how to become act, mutual. I guess. Or yeah, how to yeah. Ac- actively uh, accurately uh, behave in the society. Uh, I, I read that it was referred to as a self-criticism group, which uh, was something that I guess was used a lot during the uh, Cultural Revolution in, in China. Oh, really? Um, yeah. This idea that uh, they would that you would have to um, like a brainwashing type thing. You exactly, just have to yeah. buy into it. Sort of like a self in, self imposed brainwashing, right? To, yes, yeah. Into whatever the social. Uh, uh, convention was that you were supposedly rebelling against. Yeah, and like gay conversion therapy would be the same along the same lines. Right, and actually, what was kind of interesting about that scene too is that was the most uh, culturally culturally diverse group I think we've ever seen on the show. Yeah, yeah. Because there was I, you had an lied. Asian... There was an Asian. Yeah, that we, yes. we had done before <laughs> saying there were no more mi- nine minorities, but there's an Asian. Right, and the other guy, the other guy who was doing a lot of talking was also. Uh, he he sounded like he was like uh, French or German or something. Oh. He had some sort of accent. I d- yeah, I didn't notice him. But uh, and and that and again, again that scene is is interesting because one of the people involved in that group is is a poet who is being criticized for composing poetry when another villager said hello to her and she was too wrapped up in her subversive poetry to say hello back. Right. And uh, um, it's, that whole scene I find very interesting. It's it's a very good uh, for how short it is. It's a very interesting concept to throw into this this show. Yeah, and I I appreciated that idea because um, I know you don't. But uh, for those of us who work in a office setting, 
Uh, there is this weird thing where there are people in this world who, when you say hello to them, don't say anything back to you. <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of buy into the village's argument here about like this is unacceptable. You need to. I don't under, I don't understand what's wrong with these people. You just you say hello, they look at you, and they don't nod or say anything. <laughs> and it's just it's always the same people. I, I can't imagine being so brazenly confident as to not say hello or nod back at somebody. Right. They're right, of course. They're right, of course. Quite right. Quite right. I'm inadequate. I'm inadequate. 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 Disharmonious. Disharmonious. I'm truly grateful. I'm truly grateful. Believe me. 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 This whole um uh idea of of the uh social conversion therapy and i think is it's it's really well done um it's done in a really interesting way um it bring it brings back some of the uh proto propaganda military vibe that they had in the first episode like uh there's these posters in the in the uh, council chamber that says community needs you and it's it's Set up like the uh, uh, the uh, Uncle Sam poster. Yeah, yeah. He's point. He's pointing at you and yeah, saying we need you. It is it, very, a very politically propaganda um, situation for all of those. Right, right. And they're 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 kind of um, they're setting up this this setting where where community is kind of has kind of a nationalist bent to it. Where if you are if you're not, uh, if you're, if you're hurting the effort, I, I'm sorry. Um, if you're antisocial, you're hurting the efforts of the community and, and, and the, uh, the cause, so to speak. Right. Yep. I thought, I thought that this, the first half of this episode is probably peak prisoner in w- w- this sort of theme that they're always trying to get across is that like six being his individual self is really being sort of a problem for everybody else and him sort of resisting the overriding, you know, I guess it would basically be a state government. Um, yeah. And it, that's really good. Um, I think that, you know, as you said, there's been a remake of this show mm-hmm. um, that you don't seem to enjoy. I haven't seen it yet. Um, I do feel like I would like to see a... I'm interested in seeing that remake because I do feel like a modern... Uh, updating of this could hit the points a little bit better. Yeah. Um, it, I think it, it suffers from that problem of just being an older TV show that back then you didn't really have to explore the themes particularly well. Um, mm-hmm. It's the same with a lot of uh, stuff like Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone actually did it pretty good, but Star Trek and things like that where the older series weren't really as great at examining what they were talking about. Right. Um, and I feel I get that that becomes p- kind of the this series bigger failing for me is that occasionally I feel like they're looking at what they want to say, but they aren't quite getting there. Um, yeah. And it brings it into focus in the second half where things drastically change and it becomes a much more traditional uh, sort of th- thriller or what I, I guess it wouldn't even be a thriller. It's some sort of like trying to one up the man. Right. I think... I think it. Uh, I think you're right, and I think it's just a. A lot of it is probably just a uh, a, um, a uh, problem of the time that it was made. Right. Uh, because you know you've got forty something minutes to make a TV show, and you got to make sure you have enough action in there to keep people amused and and interesting. Like so, that's why that's why it surprises me and. That they went for this stuff at all, right? Yes, it's a it's ahead of its time in terms of that. It's also coming out at a time when uh, TV was seen as vastly inferior to right. film, right? And uh, I mean, I think they do half of an episode great here, where they've done entire episodes great in the past. Like uh, many happy returns is not something you would see on TV in the '60s, right? Yep. And uh, free for all is pretty much they stick to their stick to their metaphor through the entire thing and kind of explore that a lot. Yep. Um, so it's kind of a bummer that they, they didn't uh, explore this to its fullest extent. Yeah, uh, and I guess I, I guess that is really just a byproduct of the second half sort of devolving into a generic uh, resolution. 
to things. Yeah, mm-hmm. they like he, he they don't tie in. They sort of do, but it, it feels unearned. Like they sort of tie in the mob can be so fickle that you can just flip it on somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let's let's talk about the rest of it first. Sure. How uh, the the actual second half. <clears throat> so the second half uh, after he's declared a mutual. Uh, he's dragged in and given this uh, fake fake lobotomy, which is apparently done with sound waves. Yes, a supersonic or something they were calling it. Which I think is actually a real thing. Uh, because I, I was listening to the commentary afterwards, and the writer, his brother is a psychiatrist, and that idea actually came from his brother. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, I think it's something that is actually used. Not to the extent they do it in the show, obviously, but I think... Sound wave, uh, brain, you know, shaking. I don't know if it's, it's <laughs> brain shaking. Uh, I don't know if it's a straight lobotomy, but I think there is some sort of sound wave uh, procedure that that they uh, that they use. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it goes in the same line of thought as electrotherapy, sort of, right, a sort of right. non-invasive cause damage to the brain, and that'll change things. Right, and you know, which which at the time was very was a topical thing to talk about because yep. I mean, this is before. Uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, but it's very, it's got a very similar vibe to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure this was something that was not talked about a ton. Um, you know, the whole thing has a bit of a, uh, uh feels a bit reactionary to psychiatry in general. Yes. Um, he's a sci- he's a uh, Scientologist, obviously, right? <laughs> yeah. Very anti psychotherapy. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I like, I like the idea, I like the show that they put on for number six, um, to convince him that he's had a lobotomy. (laughs) I think that's kind of fun. Do you you mean when everyone's watching or? Yeah, where like they're going through and explaining, it's kind of like doing a magic trick. Oh, right, where they they pull out the board. Yeah, the the doctor is, is explaining how every piece works and then they show it burning through that apparently styrofoam board. (laughs) Yeah. Um, which was actually a pretty good effect. I'm not really sure how they did that, but, uh, yeah, I think they just hyper zoomed in on a magnifying glass burning through styrofoam. Oh, that's a good call. That's possible. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice kind of nice idea of like showing you the knife before they, you know, slip it away for something that's not a knife. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. Uh, it's a good, it's a good, uh, uh, sleight of hand trick. Um, and all, all ostensibly for the benefit of the villagers who are watching. Right, right. Yep. Um, the thing that I was trying to figure out, I guess, is that this sound wave lobotomy technique is something that they do actually do, right? They just didn't do it on him? I think so. Yeah, because I think the other guy that he talks to who has been lobotomized has actually been lobotomized. Yes, and Maguin doesn't have a scar, Right, he. I think it's from wearing the band aid. It was kind of hard to tell when he takes it. Oh, he does. He does have a mark there. Yep. But I mean, you're not going to see that mark again after the show. But uh, right. Um, he's he doesn't have. I don't think he has quite a severe mark as the other one does. Okay, I was a little bit confused by that. I, I thought <clears throat> him, you know, taking off his bandage and not showing a scar, which would have been a terrible plot on the the villages. Um, yeah. Half, if that was like, <laughs> don't take that band aid off. Um, but yeah, he he doesn't have nearly as much as the other guy who's sitting down in the hallway has yeah. to deal with. Oh, please, you must try to cooperate. I will. Join in with the group spirit. Naturally. Only they can help you with the committee. Naturally. Come, we are already overdue. Females. No time for tea. If that woman makes one mistake... We could lose number six. Did you hear that? Lose him. The writer uh, mentioned one thing that he didn't like about the way it turned out. And I, I have to agree with him a little bit. Um, is that he feels like number six learns, figures it out too quick. Um, because as soon as he gets back to his own place, uh, he seems to be completely. They've they've clearly done something to him. I think they said they they doped him up with something. Yes. But he has got he has enough uh, uh, mental facilities to realize that the woman is trying to drug him. And uh, uh, and he figures it out very quickly, and he reacts as though he's fi- he like shows his cards too quickly. I think. Yes, he's. Yeah, I mean, he figures it out quickly, and uh, eighty number eighty six. 
yeah. is required to be stupid just to advance the plot. Um, because, like, him being able to pour out his tea sort of flies in the face of everything that the show is sort of saying, like the omnipresent surveillance right. thing. Right. They, they, they play kind of fast and loose with that in this episode, which, as we've talked about before, is is gonna is to be expected. And, but. I mean, her whole... Yeah, right. <laughs> but her whole job is to make sure he gets drugged. And she, right, she screws right. up her... Like, <laughs> it's the internet meme, you had one job. Like, that's the one... Yeah. It's like, that's all you had to do. <laughs> um, and there was a... Uh, that's good. Uh, conti- the... There's a weird subtext of women about in this episode yeah, too. Yeah, I wa- I wanted to talk about that. Um, this episode is probably the most misogynistic episode we've seen. Yeah, um, with and again maybe the least amount of direct yelling and the more uh, symbolism. Or that's the th- yeah that's the weird thing because I was listening to the to the commentary with the writer and. He says that he purposely wrote number two as a misogynist, which is fine. I mean, right. you know, if you're gonna, you can write a character as a misogynist. It's is this the only? The world. Is this the only script this guy's written? Uh, for the prisoner, I believe it's the only one. Oh, okay. If it's his second script or something, I can see him having worked on an earlier script and then writing this one as that's how he's perceiving six to be makes sense to me. Because mm-hmm. um, I'm sure none of these had aired by the time he'd written it, so he is. It's it's an interesting choice that he decided to be a miso- make a six misogynist if he had not well, actually written on the show before. Well, no, he he meant he he wrote two as a misogynist. He wrote number two. Oh, as a two. I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't get that. Um, I, did I? I guess he only has that one weird scene where he yells at. Where he blames it on the woman had one job. Yeah, or something. he 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 yells. You know, females. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, and he does he does have uh, uh, kind of a, an angry bent towards women throughout the episode, mm-hmm. but which is fine because I mean you can write a misogynist character. I mean, right? There's plenty of bad guys who have been written that way. Yep. Um, the uh, the strange thing is that it's just overall a very um, the whole episode has this this weird. Uh, women are a pain women don't do anything right kind of vibe going through the entire thing yeah they're either they're either a nag or they can't do the job right because right or the, or they're they're weepy right um because what's the the group that you call them the court of appeals or something oh the the, the appeal subcommittee appeal subcommittee they're all women in that group um right right exactly so yeah. you, he basically has this group of women following him around and like nagging him and sort of like yelling at him being about him being unmutual and not uh, being an agreeable person. Um, right. Yeah. It's just, it's just a strange, either a strange casting decision or just a strange idea to continue down that road. Yeah. And there's, uh, six says something later to the effect of, uh, um, if there's one thing I can't stand, it's a woman who doesn't know how to make a good cup of tea. <laughs> yeah. And it's and even even that that character number eighty six she's <clears throat> she's portrayed at the beginning of the episode as a stern uh, uh, no nonsense uh, I you know I I've been through this I have I have to deal with you stop being a dickhead right Let's, a, you know a capable she, lieutenant basically right her hair and her hair is done up and uh, you know tightly and she's wearing for lack of a better term, uh, uh, <clears throat> the the village uniform. Yeah. And then once they do the, I mean, she's, and then she's even, uh, she's the one who administers the lobotomy, so she's shown capable in that, that regard. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But then after that, for the rest of the episode, she may as well be a different character. Yeah, she's just like, oh, I'm just a girl. Let me smell flowers. Let me pick uh, flowers. Well, at and- that point, at that point, she's been drugged. Right. I mean, even, even before that, I mean, once, once he gets home they've uh her her hair's down now she's wearing like a nice dress and heels right they've changed her into a much more uh 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 domesticated idiot base well i mean uh, yeah basically but, because she can't do her job right. right she can't do the one thing yeah no, and it's, it's true yeah and it's just a really weird bent for the show to take i mean we've We've joked about his uh, his aversion to women in the past, but this is the first time where it's 
it's pretty much written that way. It, the the attitude towards women is runs through the entire episode. It's not just sex, right? It, it, yeah, exactly. And it it's not just the way McGowan plays it. It's like a scripted thing, right? It's it's yeah. being pulled from somewhere. Like instead of just sort of instead of just McGowan sort of playing his interactions with people as sort of a yelly, um, sort of angry guy, right? It, it's more. Uh, decisions based on what you're having characters wear and how they interact and like how they screw up their jobs, basically. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I can't. I don't know. I can't help but wonder where that comes from. If it's a, if it's a, a result of the times or or what. I, I, <laughs> I uh, uh, another thing. I think it might just be the writer, though. Uh, not to speak ill of the dead or anything, but uh, on the commentary, he makes some crack about. Um, one of the producers or something, and he says something along the lines of, uh, it was kind of ironic that he ended up becoming one of my close friends, given my previous prejudices, because he was Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so maybe this ju- guy just, you know, you know, when his younger days had a, uh, a prejudice streak about yeah, him Yeah, just a, a, grumpy, a grumpy old man. Would that, would yeah. that be Mark Steen or something? Uh, yes, he was talking about Marxism, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, <laughs> I like, I appreciate that sort of free prejudice, though, just be like, you know, I just didn't like Jews, I didn't think I, I didn't think I was, <laughs> enough to bring it up on a commentary yeah. of a DVD. <laughs> I love them now. <laughs> you know, but, back at, you know, as was the style of the time. <laughs> I had an onion on my belt, as was the style yeah. of the time, and I hate the Jews. Jews, homosexuals, <laughs> women. Hated them all. You just have to appreciate that, he, he, you know, as uh, loathsome as the opinion might be, just the, the the brazenness of someone to just freely admit it on uh, a recording. <laughs> well, it's, it's it's that great thing about what, after you turn like 75, yeah. you can say pretty much whatever you want, nobody, and everyone's like, oh, that's great. Tell me another story. Yeah, he, or yeah, he's he's old. Things are different. But unless, things are different. unless you're a Nazi war criminal, in which case, we, it doesn't matter how old you are, you will be tried, <laughs> convicted, and killed. We will hunt you down in Argentina, and we will drag <laughs> you back to Nuremberg. It's true. That, that That is a weird thing. That's always a weird... Because they they did such horrible things, but then you see the pictures of them captured, and they're like they're literally on their deathbed. It's like right. it's just such a right. such a weird dichotomy of like what they deserve and like where they are now. Weird. Yeah, I mean, I kind of I kind of feel like it's okay. Well, I don't want to use the word okay, but it's like I I think if there's one thing that's happened in modern history that you could give a pass to. Uh, absolutely zero statutes of limitations i think the holocaust is probably a good yeah one. it's probably up there and any, any <laughs> genocide is probably a uh... yeah most most genocides yes <laughs> not the lesser genocides <laughs> but the the greater genocides yeah <laughs> time for our talk number six a talk ah yes Now that all your aggressive anxieties have been expunged, let us say forever, I know that you will feel free to speak. Particularly about that little incident which has been causing you such absurd distress. The trivia, the trivia of your resignation. The thing that actually I didn't like about the second half right away was after he's been fake lobotomized and he comes back home and he's obviously still messed up because of whatever they drugged him with. Yep. Number two immediately is like, Oh good. You're back. Now you're, you're, you're all, all of that aggression is out of your mind. So, but why did you resign? You know, it was like, I, I was really bummed that that was the, that was the whole, the whole, like, the whole drive. It's like, yeah. yeah. It's like for, for, uh, um, for setting up for setting up such a intricate uh, set of dominoes, he just for, really stumbles into knocking them all over. Yeah, you know? and they ha- they they used to do that really a lot in the early episodes. Like the the first yes. thing the first thing they do is ask why he resigned, and that was always the giveaway that it was a, right, a plot. Right, and he he comes back with a vengeance, and this one is just like, so tell me tell me why you resigned after this this all happened. It's a lot less elegant in this episode. Yes. Um, usually before they used to just kind of slip it in in conversation and that, you know, would kind of be a trigger for him. Right. 
But uh, this one is straight up. Uh, well, now that you're all fucked up, why'd you resign? Yeah, yeah. It's almost relying on an amount of serialization that I don't really know because if you if you hadn't tuned into the show before, uh, mm-hmm. he do- number two doesn't really stress that that's what he's interested in. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it's almost like a a callback. Like you have to be really right, paying right. attention to understand what that means. Um, right. And it, it really it, it really comes out of nowhere. Right? Yeah. Yeah. If this was your first show, you'd be like, resigned. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what is that? What does that mean? Yeah, I mean, even uh, uh, in the in the first in the opening credits, I mean, you get all of that. We want information, but uh, but you don't find out what that information is that they want. Right. Yeah. So w- having him pull up in the middle of an episode and be like, "Oh, by the way, why'd you resign?" You're right. If you're if you've never seen the show before, you'd be like, "What? Yeah, what the hell is he talking?" It's about? just interesting because I mean, these older TV shows are the stress is not you know to not be so serialized, um, right? Because you know. DVR didn't exist, so you you have to you have to always explain uh, things. Like in, uh, it's funny when you watch shows on Netflix or this one as we're doing now. With there wouldn't have been commercial breaks, but uh, shows where they had commercial breaks when you rewatch mm-hmm. them later on, and you'll have characters being like, "All right, so this is the plan. We're going to do this," and they explain it. And then there's obviously a commercial break, and it comes back, and they restate what they just stated. Right, because right, Because right. in real world, people would have watched five commercials and maybe forgot what they were talking about. Yeah. So it's, yeah. very, it's very weird to watch it without the commercials and have people just repeat what they just said two seconds ago. Just in case everybody missed it, this is our plan. Again, again, fade to yeah. black. Anyway, so we're going forward with the plan, which I yeah. will restate. Um, and... and I, that that also plays into uh, uh, the previously on blank things that they would do at the beginning of shows. Yeah. Like, um, I don't know if you ever watched... Uh, I, I think that stuff got increasingly ridiculous as shows got more and more... Uh, had longer storylines. Right. Um, I don't know if you ever watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Not, re- not like all the way through. I've seen episodes of it. Yeah. Well, towards the end of the series... Uh, the thing that really sucked was, uh, especially if you're watching it now, like on Netflix or something, uh, before an episode, they would go previously on blank on previously on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and then give you like (laughs) a backstory that spanned like four seasons. Right. Yep. Um, and, and clearly, uh, if they were picking out certain points, you'd be like, oh, well, obviously I know what's going to happen in this episode because... They're talking about faith here and this vampire and this plot, so all of that's going to come back in this episode. So, you know, right, yeah. So yeah. It, it's 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 an interesting. Uh, it, I mean, at the time, it made sense because if you're watching with a years broken up, <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, yep. uh, you're not going to remember all that shit. But now, if you're watching it on Netflix and you you watched those episodes like two months ago, right? Yeah, and you just it kind of it kind of feels like uh, you're uh, just. Being redundant. Yes, and uh, do you watch? Uh, do you watch Mad Men? I haven't gotten into it. There, I pl- I plan to at some point. It's becoming but. a running joke where uh, the, the Mad Men does the next week on Mad Men thing. Oh, and, like like in uh, Arrested Development. Yes, except <laughs> Matthew uh, Weiner, who's the creator of Mad Men and the head writer. Uh, mm-hmm. He like hates spoilers. Like he he just he loathes letting anyone know about what's coming up. Uh, right. Even to the extent of what year the show is taking place in an upcoming season. Oh, interesting. Um, so the next week on Mad Men has become this sort of running joke that the clips are just nonsense. Like the clips are, <laughs> the clips will be like Draper just looking up, going "What?" You know, and then and then it cuts <laughs> into someone else just standing, standing like looking at a pool, going "Get out of the pool." And it's just this weird, <laughs> nonsensical connection played up very dramatically, you know, on next week on Mad Men. And uh, it's, it's certainly ripe for parody. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, but anyway, back to uh, why did you resign? Yep. Um, yeah, but with all that in mind, it's just, yeah, it's, it's a very uh, uh, random thing to drop in there. I mean, I, it's in the style of the show, I mean, because that's what they're trying to get. Right. But it's just so clunky. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think, for me, that's the biggest failing of the second half of this episode. As you said earlier, it just kind of turns into something, a pretty standard... Uh, if there is a standard episode of The Prisoner, 
the second half of this episode is that. Right. He, where, yeah, the summary would just be the village, which has basically been presented as omnipotent, somehow screws something up, and Six seizes that weakness and then turns it around on them. Um, right, and, right. And then... While, while playing along to an extent. Right, well, yes, well... Confusing them as to his true intentions, and then flips it, flips it back on them at the end of it. Yeah. Oh, yes, everything's clear cut now. It's quite simple. <laughs> quite so. No more problems, eh? Uh, now at last we can have our little chat. Yes, I hope so. But, 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 with this, I feel that I ought to tell everyone. Ah, you need only tell me. Uh, just me. Oh, yes, yes, of course. But there must be people who've got things, uh, secrets that you want to know. And if I was to speak out publicly, I, I, I might... Ah, yes, inspire the others to speak out also. Yes, exactly. What a good idea, number six. Highly commendable. It, it, it suffers from the, the other thing is that, like, since Six is the main character um, and the, sh- the show only follows him, mm-hmm. you, you're never in doubt as to what's going on. Right. There, there's right. never any mystery as to, oh, I wonder if he's buying into this or or what. You know, I, we've kind of gotten to the point where I, I don't think anyone can seriously watch an episode this late in the run and think that he has been taken control of uh, just because that's never happened before. Right. So it, and 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 for, and for something, I mean, <laughs> at this point, the stuff they've put him through uh, for for him to just be undone by a fake lobotomy or like basically like someone shining a flashlight at him and giving him a pill, yep. uh, is kind of unbelievable. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think what would have worked better. Well, okay. Let's talk about the ending. First. Sure. So my biggest problem with the ending is it comes out of nowhere and doesn't make any real sense because no, uh, what happens is, uh, from, number from what six, points are you talking about? Uh, from the point where number six is like, I would like to address the crowd. Okay. And so he, he wants to, uh, number two is ecstatic because number six wants to address the entire village and, and, uh, confess things, et cetera, et cetera. So they have this big public meeting where number six playing along still, he gets up there and starts to bow to number two and, and the way the village is run. And then he very quickly turns it around and says that number two has is being unmutual. Well, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Girl. That's right. The uh, yes. Oh, I forgot. He hypnotizes the girl. Right. Yeah. Which also comes out of nowhere. Yeah. So that's another another uh, <laughs> um, skill of number six is that we didn't know he had. Right. Uh, so and at what, this point, what, he's, gle- what green light was he talking about on the watch? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to look too close because I didn't want to get hypnotized myself. <laughs> That's true, yeah. But yeah, at this point, he is a Olympic class fencer and boxer, yep. a gymnast, um, water skier, water skier, and now apparently hypnotist. Yes, and and um, world class Roshu champion. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> trampolinist. Um, yeah, I forgot he hypnotized us. So th- th- I guess it's nothing in this ending really. It all just kind of happens, you know, just to get us yeah, to the end. I guess, I guess, I guess to go back a little bit, he uh, um, he pulls a uh, uh, the the old the old switch the cups routine on on number eighty six, where she she uh, fucks up her job again. Yeah, it's he. She puts the the pill in his tea, but then he pulls the thing about not knowing how to make a cup of tea and pours it out yep. and pours a new cup of tea, to which she then puts another pill in <laughs> while she thinks he's not looking. But then while she's not looking, he switches the cups. Yep. And uh, which I think that's when, when number two yells out stupid woman, which <laughs> if he's, if he's watching her, Oh no, 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 that, that was, was earlier. That was, I think. No, it was, it was actually after it was after she gets drugged. Um, oh really? Oh yeah, yeah I guess that's true. Yeah when, yeah. when he, when six puts the pill in the tea, they cut back to two watching it, and he says something like, "Ah, oh, domestic bliss," or you know, yeah, some shit. what a what a, a battle of two high caliber spies that t- that tea poisoning <laughs> thing was like. Well, it's like, uh, did you ever see um, uh, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind? I think I have. I can't remember who's in that one. Uh, Sam Rockwell. And, oh, maybe uh, I haven't. 
Uh, it's it's a pretty fun movie. I'm thinking um, of the Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> that would be an interesting movie. <laughs> Confessions of Dangerous Minds, where the where the game show host, who is also a spy, goes to teach underprivileged minority kids exactly. in an urban school. And Coolio yeah. has a hit for the yeah. hit of the summer. Yep. Um, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind is about uh, uh, the creator of the Gong Show, who in his uh, Memoirs claim to be an assassin for the CIA. Oh, I think I know that story. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a really fun movie. I, I recommend it. Um, but there's a scene where he and Julia Roberts are having this same back and forth, and it's just they're both spies, so they're both constantly switching the cups every time one of them looks away. Right. Yep. And the way he ends up getting her, spoilers. The way he ends up getting her is the one of the times she looks away, he doesn't switch the cups. Yep. Yep. So then when he looks away, she switches the cups and drinks the one with the pill. Right. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's, they do it in, in The Princess Bride. They've done it in, you know, probably every spy movie ever. Probably did it in Mr. Uh, and Mrs. Smith, and I just can't, I can't remember. <laughs> probably did it in at least one James Bond movie. Yes, I'm, I'm, without a doubt that's happened. If not more. Yep. Uh, but, yeah, so uh, she ends up getting drugged. And getting all loopy and is loopy for the rest of the episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and Lo- loopy know, is I, like flirty. Yeah, she gets flirty and and just wants to smell flowers yeah, and yeah. pick flowers for number two. Weird, weird flowers. It looked like she just picked up a head of cabbage and was like yeah. coming her face into it. <laughs> it's strange. Um, but yeah, it's at the, I, the thing that kind of confused me was that it's at that point after he after she gets drugged that number two is like ah stupid woman or stuff. But he doesn't do anything about it because at that point you should assume that number six knows what's going on. Yes, because clearly, unless he is so misogynistic that he just thinks she clearly just fucked up, right? You should assume that six knows something fishy's going on, and you should try to do something else or so i don't know but it's just he should have he just takes it out on her well it's surprised at being being such a misogynist that he didn't just do it himself like, yeah, that's the, a good point. The pro- yeah and i don't see why he couldn't yeah you know what, what if you like what if two drank the thing and then convinced himself that he was being unmutual Ooh. you know oh that's good yeah Unmutual. Social conversion for number two. The unmutual. Number 86 has a confession that number two is unmutual. Unmutual. Look at it. An unmutual who desires to deceive you all. Unmutual. Your welfare committee is the tool of those who wish to possess your mind. Well, that, so that brings me to, you know, my problem with the ending. So he... Uh, uh, 86 gets gets drugged. Uh, six is fine now. He knows what's going on. Sorry, what, so one he, interruption is that I can't think of uh, 86 without thinking of that Green Day song. <laughs> I don't think I know there's, that There's, there's a uh, Green Day 86, and there's no return to 86. I just keep thinking that every time she gets drugged. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, she gets drugged. Six knows what's going on. He uh, tracks her down, and she gets all loopy, and he hypnotizes her into telling him exactly what's going on. Right. Um, and then after that, he puts this other uh, 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 control into her brain that she's going to uh, do something for for number six when the bell tolls four. Yeah, yep. And so it's at that point that he uh, six does something similar to what he does in Schizoid Man, where he goes to number two and he's like, "Oh, I'm I feel I feel great. I just feel like confessing everything." Right. Yep. I feel like. What, is there anything you'd like to know? Let's. let's <laughs> he's like, oh. Actually, yes, there's many things we'd like to do. Let's call the village all together, and I'll confess. Yeah, and he's like, well, I'd I'd love to do it in front of everybody. He's like, oh, absolutely, yes, we'll do it right now. So (laughs) they they call this big meeting, and then when they're up there, he he, uh, bows, uh, kowtows to uh, number two in the village. And then then the bell tolls four, and 86 shows up and points at number two and says, unmutual, number two is being unmutual. And uh, the crowd then starts chanting it, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And then they chase him down, and, and that's the end of the episode, basically. Yes, yeah. Or they, um, cha- they chase down his stunt double, <laughs> who is <yes>. a totally <laughs> different actor. Yes. Um, and, yeah, I think, 
I like the idea of that. I love the idea that number two becomes unmutual. However, the execution is ludicrous. Like he doesn't do anything. No, there's no. It's uh, very. No... It's very easy to just turn. All you have to do is just tell the mob that someone else is unmutual, and they will buy it. You know. They, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess there's there's something about that that I think works. If you're, I think you mentioned the fickleness of the mob, et cetera, yep. et cetera or like um, you get to a point with that kind of stuff and that sort of criticism that eventually you start to it turns in on itself. Yes. Yep. Um, and it starts taking down its own its own members and stuff, which is fine. But I feel like it doesn't really work here. No, it, at least not the way that they do it. It do, it doesn't tie in with the story en- enough. There's no. Right. It's not. He doesn't. His plot to convince them or change their minds doesn't have any impact on how it actually happens. Um, right. They, right. They're just. They're just standing there, and then they're like, "He six just says number two is the bad guy," and they go. Kill number two and chase right, chase right. him off there. There was it wasn't earned. They didn't earn yeah. that ending. Yeah, I think I think what what would have worked for me is if um, number two does or says something that in front of this crowd where where he is oblivious to the fact that what he's doing or saying is considered to be unmutual. Yeah, that's that's better. So, so like you have an idea of. Uh, uh, the person in power thinking that these rules that he has set up do not apply to him. Yep. But when he does it in front of this group who has been brainwashed to follow these rules and to uh, cause someone who does not follow them to become a pariah, right. um, turns on him, I, I or or uh, you know hold those hold him to the same standard they hold themselves. I think that's a much more interesting ending. Yeah, that's. Uh, that's like severely better than what, what actually goes down. <laughs> and, but that's all. That's all it would take. It's rewrites. Re- rewrites. Fifty years later. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just. Yeah, it's probably a rushed scripting production type. Maybe, thing. maybe, maybe whoever uh, whoever's doing the audio plays for Big Finish based on the prisoner mm-hmm. uh, listens to this podcast and will steal all of our ideas. Don't you dare steal my ideas. These are my <laughs> ideas. Don't be unmutual. <laughs> I, I feel uh, like unmutual insurance would be a great parody. Or something. <laughs> like, I don't know, unmutual funds, just anything like that. <laughs> yeah, just a, I don't know, a, a letdown of an ending that. Yeah, it wraps up too quickly, and and for such a good we, first half, it's just. It's ironic you say yeah. it wraps up quickly because it's literally half the episode that you know it's like. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean the actual. And beat. It's yes. Just so it's yes. it's not me. It's this guy, and then it's right. Over. Yeah. Because I, um, I I feel the downturn started post lobotomy. Oh yeah. No, I agree. Okay. I think everything after the lobotomy is not right. Great. Yeah. Or I shouldn't say I shouldn't say it's not great. I mean, it's it's not bad. It's just cliche. Yeah, and it's just uh, when it's preceded by such good stuff. Right. Yep. Um, it's a bummer that it just turns so formulaic after that. Yes, yep, I'd agree. It is number two you should applaud. Until he brought about my social conversion, and believe me, it was him and not your committee, until then, I was a rebel, an unmutual, senselessly resisting this, our fine community. So we talked a little bit about when this was produced. It was produced directly after um, It's Your Funeral. And I feel like this is another episode that you can kind of drop in that same, uh, as far as uh, positioning on, on, the, uh, uh, on the order. Mm-hmm. I think this is another one you can kind of drop into that, that lull where he's sort of transitioning in, into a, uh, uh, a villager. Because the biggest thing that stood out to me at the end is... He gets number two, basically jumped, and then he just like goes home. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't try to escape or anything. Right. Yeah. I mean, because clearly at this point he must be his will to escape must be suppressed, if not broken. Right. Yep. And but he's he's and, still putting up something of a, a fight. This is like an early mid episode. I, I would. Yeah. Think. Well, the thing that I really like is that 
it, they emphasize um, when they... I've never understood why they try so hard with Six. I mean, I understand they want the information, but if they just, like, left him alone, he would be, he would, that would be the best way to deal with it. Right. Because yeah. it's when, when you position him against the social and, uh, uh, social constructs and threats to his individuality is when he becomes his most hostile. Right. Yep. I mean, that scene in the council chamber when they're, you know, when he's spinning around in the chair and they're all talking to yep. him. A, he's not taking anything seriously, and he's just being a dickhead to everybody. Yeah, he is. It's which is great. I mean, I, lo- I love, I love it when he when he starts doing that. Um, it's funny. But- I find I find him playing that way to be slightly obnoxious to me as yeah. as a viewer, <laughs> um, which is probably effective. But yeah, I, I don't. I feel I feel McGowan plays it slightly too dickish almost. Um, he's he's exceptionally obnoxious to them in this. Episode. He is. Yeah, with the. Um, I just I, I noticed when whenever he does that weird rolling R thing, and he yeah. does it quite a bit in this one, and it just something about that just upsets me. It's like someone who overpronounces <laughs> like Spanish words, and you know, and they're not Spanish. Well, he's just putting a flair on it to to emphasize, right? Yeah, because he tears up the. the uh, he's they're like, do you have the pamphlet? And he's like, yes, yeah. I do, and then tears it up and like throws it in the air and all, all that stuff. Right, yeah. right, yeah, and uh, you know, it's. It's it's when they put him into these situations, this is when he's going to do his damnedest to make sure that you regret doing it. Right, yep, yep. So, <laughs> I always thought, like, you know, instead of, uh, honestly, you know what would have made the most sense is if, if um, the best way to, to punish him wouldn't have been to do this whole lobotomy thing. It would have been, it may, may, this may have actually made for a more interesting episode as well um when he is first declared on mutual he's basically turned into a ghost where nobody will interact with him nobody will serve him right yeah nobody will acknowledge his presence and i think that's actually a really interesting way to go because as we've talked about all of the other things that they stripped away from him the one thing that he holds on to is his identity which is why in Dance of the Dead it was so profound that they've they've effectively killed him. Right. In this uh, to the to the outside world in this episode they're effectively killing him to the village world. Yep. Making him a complete shadow. Yeah. I think I, I like that idea. I think it would be um, it's a good conflict because I think I, I don't know if the show doesn't really address it, so I'm just going to call it an internal conflict that the show has. Where uh-huh. his individuality is seen as this great thing, but he yeah. can't do anything without other people. So it's okay. this like give and take between being your own person, but also, you know, humans sort of being social creatures and like they need each other to uh, interact with and to basically drive the narrative and for him to get out or have anything any chance to get out involves other people, usually. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Generally. Which is yeah. so. You know, that would be an interesting sort of, you know, if you took that theme and sort of stuck with it, like his individuality all by himself is really the worst thing that could happen to him. Mm. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. Because um, uh, I think uh, I think uh, something else that the, the writer says in the commentary is something to that effect that is it's taking taking this character who is a self-described loner and showing him what being alone actually means. Right, yeah. And, and it's it's uh, and, and I hate the juice. <laughs> <laughs> Did, is, am I speaking as the taking the loner and showing him what being alone actually means, <laughs> and showing the world how awful women are. <laughs> is, uh, was the guy was the guy sort of an old British guy? Yes. Was yeah. it, was he just by himself in the commentary? Yeah, just oh, him. interesting. Does yeah. McGowan do I, any of the commentaries? No, he doesn't. Um, there, which I actually like. Um, there's uh, that with the DVDs comes a, a documentary that's like a, a, epi- a series spanning documentary that talks about every episode, etc. You know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, the production sure. and interviews pretty much everybody who is still alive at the time who worked on the show. Yep. It's a it's a great great documentary, but conspicuously absent is McGoo. Right. Yeah. Um, but at the beginning of the documentary, before it even starts, there's a, uh, a title on the screen that says something to the effect of um, uh, 
anything I have to say about this show is I hopefully said with the show itself. So I have nothing further to say on the subject. Yeah. And then it's signed. His autograph is signed yep. there, which I really like because I mean, at that, <laughs> there's like that's the most Magoo in response I could ever imagine him giving. Yeah. at that point. When, when was this made? Uh, when the DVDs were made, so I want to say uh, early 2000s. Okay, so he's he's almost like a proto David Chase at that point for the Sopranos. Oh yeah, well I mean it's he, as we'll talk about probably more after after we finish the series. Uh, his life concerning the prisoner post the show is very interesting as far uh, as far as his interaction with the show right. because almost immediately there's a backlash because of how the show ends. And then, uh, once the show, uh, grows its cult following and reruns, uh, you know, like ten, a handful of years mm-hmm. later, you've got this whole younger group of people who are grasping onto it and grasping onto these ideas. And like we were talking about last week, creating these theories and stuff and constantly asking him questions about it. And there's only so many, ways you can answer the, the there's only so many times you can answer a question the same way of you know well i mean that might be there if you see it but that's not how i right. you know that people are projecting these things onto it and what he says starts to matter less and less right yeah yeah so i think he just got to a point where it was yeah whatever whatever i had to say about the show i've already said it um you can think whatever you want right yep which is probably the healthier way to approach it Yes. There's nothing worse than a... Uh, I, I've sort of learned that I need shows to... Ha- shows need to end with a little bit of ambiguity. Uh, yeah. The worst season fina- or series finales are ones that try too hard to tie things up. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, which, you know, I loved Breaking Bad, but I thought the ending of Breaking Bad failed in that regard. Um, okay. And I've also come to love The Sopranos ending. As a mm-hmm. season or a series finale, um, yeah. so it's it's that kind of thing. It's like, you know, if you want people to keep thinking about your show, you kind of have to be a little bit vague with how things right, wrap right. up. And I mean, he does a good job here. The problem is that the fan base might be too uh, interested in what is actually going on yeah. when there might not be an answer for what's going on. Right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I I, I hate it when they when they do. Uh, um, when they, even when they, I guess not having watched Lost, but having heard about the way the show ended, it seems like it falls into this category that I don't like, which is trying to be ambiguous, but also making sure you give yourself a giant pat on the back. Yep. Yep. Where it's like, well, we have to make sure every character gets screen time and then everybody's hugging and it's like, wow, we, isn't it great that we made television right. for yeah. like six years? You know, that, that annoys me a yep. lot. Yep. But yeah, I, I think uh, I'm I, I'm interested that you said that. I'll, I'll be I'm really curious to see how you react to the last episode. Yeah, we only have a couple left, right? Four or something. Yeah, maybe. We, yeah, yeah. We get we're getting pretty close. Hmm. I take it you checked my file regarding hostility. Your files are no concern of ours. Any information about you is with number two. Right. It is the duty of this committee to deal with complaints. Complaints. Your complaints. Well done. I have several. But yeah, as far as as far as has uh, Mark Steen uh, left yet? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Um, I believe he's still there at this point. He was in the credits, but I didn't know if they just kept him in there. I I can't remember off the top of my head. I believe his name gets taken off when he let oh, when he left. Yep. But don't quote me on that now. I'll look into it, uh, and you know, I'll, 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 we, we can talk about it when it happens. Yes. Um. But yeah, it, the. The placement, I think you're right. It's probably like an early, early to mid uh, uh, transition period episode. Um, it's interesting that it was the next one produced directly after "It's Your Funeral," uh, given how uh, hotly uh, contested and uh, tense the shooting of that one seemed to be. Right. To the point where people were saying that they thought Magoon was having a nervous breakdown. Yep. Uh, the very following episode to have one that, I mean, he did he did grab control of this one as well. Because the writer said, <laughs> the writer said that I thought uh, he, he um, fired the director of this one as well. He did. Okay. Yes, he fired the director and he directed it himself. 
But I mean, it's pretty it's pretty tightly made. I mean, it's it's good. It's not like it's right. <laughs> it's not like it's the ramblings of a madman. No, no, he's yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd I'd love to see the initial director cut. I mean, he he only worked for a day, but it's like it, it'd be interesting to see like what he wasn't getting or like what yeah, they were doing. Yeah. Well, I wonder how much of it is um familiarity with the show. Yeah, yeah. Because I think if I had to take a guess, uh, at the point they're they're over, I don't know they're just about halfway through the production at this point, right? So you would think, and that with so little time uh, to do so much, mm-hmm. that they Magoon probably just felt like it. They need he needed someone who knew the style of the show right, yeah. and knew how the show worked. So he could just do it instead of having a new director come in and be like, oh, well, I can't seem to understand what this show's about. Could I have a day? No, you don't have a day. You have to shoot the goddamn thing. So it would. uh, And it's good that he's the the series strongest director, which is is kind of weird. Even on the uh, uh, on the commentary, the writer talks about how uh, when McGowan read the script, he said he immediately fired the director because he was like, I'm the only person that I this guy can't shoot this. I have to shoot this. Yep. And I think it, that kind of, while the writer talks about it as being, he was, uh, uh, the writer was very uh, upset about that, that his his first script for the show was being uh, wrenched away by an egomaniac. He actually called him an egomaniac. Yep, yep. Um, the rest of, and, and through the rest of the epi- uh, commentary, he kind of talks shit about him. <laughs> at, at, the, at the end, he's like, I know I've said a lot of things, but this episode came out really good. And he did a really good job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's that that sort of reading the reading the script and then making the decision that he had to shoot it seems like a creative decision where it's like all right there's shit going on here that I don't have time for someone else to try and figure out. Yeah, yeah. I know how this works. I know how the show works. I'll just do it myself. Yep. I could be completely wrong, but that's how that's how I read. No, that, that makes sense. That's that that would seem to be is, is firing someone so quickly. You know, a day's work is not really a lot of stuff to do for a director. So. And at this point, yeah, they're getting getting through it. He just needs to pull it all together and not not have people asking him questions, I guess, which he seems to hate. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the writer goes on to say that um, that his issues with the first draft were that were mainly with the lobotomy scene. Apparently, the original writing of the lobotomy scene was like a legit lobotomy, yep. where they would carve open his head. It's a, but the, the the way that they pull it over is his pull the wool over his eyes is they have a video that six is watching while they do this that features an exact double of six who is actually getting a lobotomy. Okay. The Curtis is brought back. Well, that's the thing. So uh, and like it's this gruesome thing. And uh, Magoon said, "Well, first of all, this is way too gruesome for television. There's no way we can right. do this. Secondly, it's too confusing." Because even though we know that it's a double... How, how do you cetera, explain cetera, that, that cleanly to yeah. the audience, I guess? yeah. And thirdly, interestingly enough, uh, that finding an exact double to operate on is, quote, unbelievable. Oh. <laughs> now, while generally I would say yes, especially since they already did that, why would they have... I mean, well, I guess they could do it, but but it would be awesome if they just... Use Curtis, right? Like Curtis's dead <laughs> would, dead body is brought back. Yeah, that would that would be a great callback. Yep. Um, but that sort of that cutting of the script are all all makes sense. I mean, it, the uh, the way they ended up doing it works. I think it's more uh, it's not gruesome, but it is definitely visual. Right. Um, and the so basically the the decisions he was making were sound decisions. Right. So they. And that plus the way the effectiveness with which he directed this episode doesn't seem like someone who's losing. Right. Yep. Um, so you know that just again makes me wonder. You know, I'm sure he was he was under a ton of stress and was probably even hard to work with when he was under that much stress. But uh, it doesn't it doesn't look like he's losing his mind mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Oh, the other thing that uh, <laughs> the other thing that he wanted changed was uh, apparently there was a scene where. Six and eighty-six kiss, 
And as you can imagine, that did not make the final yeah, cut. Yeah, that's, that's shocking. Totally surprising here. Um, but again, I mean, I know uh, they they cite his Catholicism and how he didn't want to be seen doing anything lascivious, et cetera, et cetera. I still think that makes sense because as I was watching the episode, I was trying to figure out where the hell that would even go. And the only place I could think of it would be after she gets drugged. Because why else would they be kissing? I'd, I'd imagine it would be that scene where they're sitting at a table after yeah. she's been drugged and she's sort of like looking at him uh, with like flirty eyes. Yeah. And like that would feel, I mean, depending on how they played it, that would, I mean, if they could play it as her being, you know, uh, extra flirty and advancing, even though he doesn't really want her to. Or if they were just making out, it would, it would, <laughs> maybe it would go along the lines of the writer's uh, predisposition towards women, where it's number six taking advantage of a drug. Right. Woman. That's I maybe think that's just the, something that he likes to it do. Would, it would appear much worse with like a modern interpretation of you know, right. like it, anyone being under the influence can't make a decision for themselves. So yeah. therefore, this is wrong. And especially at that point in the story, where six is knows knows a, it, that something is going on if not everything right. he's not gonna just start making out with a woman right you know, yeah, like he, he's got shit to do he doesn't have time for this yeah he's got shit to do he knows that this woman is against him I mean that's just not what he does yeah. um you know I don't know so I think I think that would be I can understand why putting it in there would be like well we need to have some sort of romance or, I don't right know, it yeah, just seems yeah. that seems like regardless of intentions it's a cut that was worth worth making. Yeah, it, it makes sense. It was a good cut. Planning a funeral? I have to report. On plant life? To number two. Two. I want to make him happy. Really? I want to make him happy. The ecstasy of illusion. Is there anything else you want to talk about? No. Nope. Final impressions? No, I think we hit everything. A much better first half than a second half. And um, it's probably one of the top episodes that I've, I've seen so far. Yeah, I would agree. I think the first half is strong enough that the ideas they present, uh, carry it really well. Um, I think, I think they do a better job in this one than they did in the last one. Um, well, I don't know. I'd say, you know, now that I think about it, it's probably, it's probably the same, same ratio because, Fun uh, it's your funeral had a good idea, but there just wasn't enough to get it to fifty minutes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this one starts really strong, but then just kind of turns formulaic. So it's probably about the same. Breaks up the same. Yes. But, uh, yeah. I think I think the the difference being this one starts really strong, whereas funeral just kind of limps to life. Yeah. It, they just they sort of. If yeah, they flipped it around. They they had a good stretch where they were working on the end of the previous one and the start of the first one, where everything was like clicking, and the yeah. stuff that surrounds it is not as uh, as strong. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I would agree. Uh, how would you rate the plan? Uh, it's like a two. Yeah. Um. It's <laughs> it's it's all fine until he just for plot reasons has to have eighty six deliver the drug that is vital to the success of this operation. Um, so it's, you know, I like the idea of the um, lobotomy. Mm -hmm. It's just everything that follows that is not particularly very good or uh, it doesn't make sense in terms of why two would do this. Um, why he would leave all these loose ends up to people that seem to be incompetent at doing it. Yeah, it's... <laughs> His plan is like one of those plans that they that they do in movies where uh, um, they ask what the plan is and they lay out this really complicated first part and they're like and then what? And he's like, well, I don't know. I haven't really thought past that. Yeah, yet. yeah. How, how, once you uh, get in, once you get into the vault in like Ocean's Eleven, and you're not sure yeah. how you get how you get out of the vault. Ex exactly, exactly. Um, <laughs> It makes me think that this number two is 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 quite the philosopher because the the uh, the social constructs that he set up at the beginning of the episode only to just kind of not really be interested in the uh, uh, specifics of how to follow through on it seem kind of yeah. kind of yeah he's he's more dreamer and less a, a yeah. pragmatist <laughs> he's he's really just got his head in the clouds and he's his feet aren't on the ground yeah um, 
Yeah, I would agree. It's probably a two. Uh, it's, I, I think the, the the setup is is good, uh, but the way he falls through on it is is yeah. not. Yeah. Um, and I wish I wish they had you know I I don't know if when you write a character like number two who is clearly misogynist I don't know if it's if it's the writer's duty to uh, make sure that 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 character gets a comeuppance because of that or whatnot mm-hmm. um, but it it may have been interesting the way that they lean on it so heavily throughout the episode it may have been interesting to have that character be undone by uh, uh, by something that he does towards 86 or towards the women of the village or something. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, know. 86 kind of does it, only through being hypnotized, but she, she, she yeah. is ultimately his downfall. She does it, but not... I mean, not of her own will. She's she's literally roofied into yes, doing yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah. I mean, if she had done it of her own volition, then that would probably have worked pretty yep. well. But. yep. But yeah, that is that's about it for a change of mind. Um, not bad, not great. Good start. Yeah, good start, bad finish. Story of my yeah. life. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we will be back. Oh, sorry. Do you want to plug anything? Oh, uh, sure. If you guys like Star Trek, where uh, I'm doing a Star Trek podcast that Clay's on occasionally, you can go to thepenskypodcast dot com. Sorry for all those plosives on the mic and. Uh, <laughs> Otherwise, you can check me out on YouTube. Just search for the Penske file. Awesome. And as I say every week, I'm by no means an expert on this. So if you have anything you want to uh, correct me on or anything you'd, any feedback you'd like to give us, you can email us at uh, the, the prisoner podcast at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at prisoner podcast. And we've had some email from people, and it's you know great to hear from you. We all have some... Uh, really interesting views on the show that is continuously fun to think about. So we're looking forward to some Absolutely. And uh, next week, we will be back with Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling, but maybe we should just take the week off because Magoon basically takes the episode off. Excellent. When his mind is transferred into the body of a person who is not him, <laughs> and he is only in it for like maybe three minutes. Oh, awesome. Well. Yeah, so... <laughs> Will, does he direct it? No? Uh, no, he was off uh, shooting a movie at the time, oh. so I had to come up with one of those how do we do an episode without him kind of how, things. He, he shot a movie for a week? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know how long his, his schedule was, but this episode was produced in the period of time he was gone shooting the movie. Oh, okay. Did he have a big role? It just seems like it's weird that he could just leave mid-series... He was like, uh, I would say he was like a second or third build. Oh, okay. It was kind of it, there were some other stars in the movie, yep. um, but he doesn't have a gigantic part. But he's he's pretty he's he's pretty oh, good. Okay. I mean, he, he's great in everything. Yep. yep. Um, and that was actually episode fourteen, uh, filmed fourteenth. So they were getting towards the end. And, oh, right. And <laughs> basically, uh, now that I'm looking at the last four, um, one of them was shot sixth. And the other ones were shot in order, so it was 14, 15, 16, and 17. Okay. And they are all definitely... And... We've kind of we've kind of run out of okay. ideas. Episodes. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, good. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to running out of ideas. Yeah. Interesting. So anyway, well, I shouldn't I shouldn't say the 17, the last one is run out of ideas. Well, well, we'll talk about it when we get to it. But, but, th- anyway. but those must all be post Markstein. Uh, yes, I believe that. Yeah. They okay. Are. I'll, I'll I'll go back and I'll I'll check and see when he left, and then uh, we can talk about that. Sure. Next week Sounds well. good. So yeah, we will say see you next time with "Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling," and that's about it. We'll see you later. Be guys. seeing you. Well, there you go. There's a change of mind. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope the skypiness wasn't too bad. If you did enjoy it, we'd love it if you left us a rating or a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you guys and hear what you think of the show. So, 
That's it for this week, and we will see you next week with Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling. Bye.